Thank you for coming. I'm Martin Wick. I'll speak about effective TensorFlow for non-experts. I'll later introduce Francois, who will take the second half of the talk. Um, so TensorFlow, why? Uh, so I have a son. You'll see him later in the talk, actually. And uh, when I used to explain to him how image search works, I would have to say something like, oh, we, he has a computer that looks at the metadata and then looks where the images are. And now when I explain how this works, I can just say, well, the computer looks at the images. And if you search for, say, cherry blossom, it looks at the images, all of them in the world. And you know, whenever it sees one that has cherry blossoms in it, it returns it. That's a much better story. And you've seen a lot of this at this particular event. Um, AI is now going to be everywhere. And machine learning is everywhere. And you, you know, it, it generates these products that were impossible to imagine before. Um, what makes these products work in reality is, for us at least, TensorFlow. And this enables us to make these apps and make these products that use machine learning. And once you've written one of these models, one of these machine learning systems in TensorFlow, you can deploy it anywhere in mobile. TensorFlow is truly what enables apps that tell hot dogs from not hot dogs. <laughs> so <laughs> why don't we see that more? You know, why, is it, why are hot dog not hot dog apps so so cutting edge. The main reason is complexity. And complexity is in various shapes. So one of all, one, first of all, um, complexity is computational complexity. Computational complexity used to be a big thing. And now, with cloud and with all the availability of you know, data centers that you can rent, that's really not much of an excuse anymore. So we've kind of solved this problem, assuming your code can run in a data center. But you also have to contend with, you have to make your code, your, your models, your uh, apps work on all these different platforms. In order to train them in the data center, you need to work on CPUs, on GPUs. Uh, you probably have heard by now we have this thing called a TPU. It should work there too, because that's going to be fast. Um, and of course, if you want to deploy it, once you're done, it needs to work on a mobile device. If you're into IoT or embedded systems, it has to work there too, say on a Raspberry Pi or something like that. So um, that's making that happen is hard. And finally, machine learning itself is actually you know, fairly complex. Um, so that's why we have TensorFlow. And <coughs> TensorFlow gives you distribution out of the box so that you can run it in the cloud if you need to do that. Um, it works on all of the hardware you need to, to work on. And it's fast and it's flexible. And what I'm going to tell you today is that it's also super easy to get started. And that's why we're here. So TensorFlow takes all the details of a distributed system and redundant hardware and just hides them from you, takes care of them. You don't have to know about it necessarily. It's, it's nice if you do, but if you don't, that's not, that's not a problem. What you mostly see is the front end. And what I'm going to talk about today is the Python front end. Um, the generic thing that people used to say, oh, this is TensorFlow, it's pretty low level. Um, so you know, talk, you're thinking about like multiplying matrices, adding vectors together, that kind of thing. What we built on top of that is libraries that help you do more complex things easier. Um, we built a library of layers that help you build models, and Francois is going to talk more about that. We built training infrastructure that helps you actually train a model and evaluate a model and um, put it in production. Um, <coughs> and Again, this can, you can do with Keras, or you can do with estimators. And Francois is going to talk about Keras. And finally, we build models in a box. And those are really full, complete machine learning algorithms that just run. And all you have to do is instantiate one and go. That's mostly what I'm going to talk about today. So usually, when you talk about, oh, my first model in TensorFlow, it's usually something simple, like let's, have, let's fit a line to a bunch of points or something like that. But nobody is actually interested in fitting a line to a bunch of points distributed. It doesn't really happen all that much in reality. So we're not going to do that. <coughs> I'm going to show you instead how to handle a variety of features um, and then train and evaluate different types of models, possibly distributed. And um, we do that on a data set of cars, because we have that. Uh, I have uploaded all the code I'm going to show you to this 
um, address, which has both an O and a 0, so be a little bit careful. Uh, and what I've, what I've done there, it, it'll work with TensorFlow 1.2. And I am not sure whether it's been announced previously, but there is now one, TensorFlow 1.2, the first release candidate. So my code will work with that and nothing earlier. So you have to watch out. All right. So the first model today will be about predicting the price of a car from uh, a bunch of features about the car, information about the car. All right. So without anything more, let's just do code. The rest of the talk is going to be code, mostly. Um, this is it. This is my model definition in TensorFlow. Um, I'm exaggerating only a little bit, because this only takes into account three different things. So first here, we define the input. And I'm defining three different what we call feature columns. <coughs> I'm telling the model that it, it should expect an input that is a categorical feature, a string, that's called make in the input. And uh, I'm going to transform this into something that's usable by my machine learning algorithm by hashing it. So I declare it this way, a declarative way of telling you what to do with the, feature, if the inputs. The next thing is I'm going to say, oh, there's something called horsepower. And that's just a number. So I call it numerical column. And then there is something called cylinders, uh, num of cylinders in the input. <coughs> and that's also a string, but it has very few values. So I'm just going to give you all the values directly here in the code. So this, in this data set, it actually is the case that num of cylinders is encoded as the words 2, 3, 4, 6, and 8, I think. So that's it. So there's probably many more of these. But in principle, that's what you do. And you say, OK, this is, this is what my input looks like. And then we specify what kind of machine learning algorithm we want to apply to this. And in my case here, I'm going to use first a linear regressor, which is kind of the simplest way to make him to, to learn something. And I'm, all I have to do is tell him, hey, look, uh, you're going to use these input features that I've just declared. That's it. And I'm done. Now, I still have to give it some input data. <coughs> and TensorFlow has off-the-shelf input pipeline for most formats. Uh, or from any formats. In particular here, in this example, I'm using input from pandas. So I don't, I don't know who knows pandas. It's a Python library, can read a bunch of stuff, process data. It's nice. Um, so I'm going to read input from a pandas data frame. And really what I'm telling it here is I want to use the batches of 64. So each iteration of the algorithm will use 64 input data pieces. I'm going to shuffle the input, which is always a good thing to do when you're training. Please always shuffle the input. And num epochs equals none means cycle through the data indefinitely. If you're done with the data, just do it again. And then I can say, OK, train me my thing for 10,000 steps, say. And what happens then is that TensorFlow goes off and trains my thing. Uh, this is what the log output looks like. You know, actually, any interesting information for it. What's more interesting is that uh, TensorFlow will also integrate with other tools that we have. In particular, it'll integrate with something called TensorBoard. Now, TensorBoard is this wonderful front end that the training uh, system writes um, writes data for, and then you can visualize it and you can look into it. And one of the things that you can see, what I show here, is what's called the loss curve. Loss curve is kind of the most important thing to look at if you're looking at if you're trying to train a model. And what we see here is that our loss, that is kind of the error that the that the model makes when looking at data, is decreasing over time. And that means it's learning something. Plain and simple. So good, that's good. The model is learning something. Great. Um, <clears throat> The next thing I can do with TensorBoard is I can actually look at the model that was created and look at the lower levels of the model, look at what we call the graph. TensorFlow works by generating a graph, and then this graph is shipped to all of the distributed workers that it has, and it's executed there. Um, you don't have to worry about this too much, but it's awfully useful to be able to inspect this graph when you're doing debugging or something like that. So here is the graph that was generated by the model declaration that I showed earlier. And I've highlighted in red here uh, the part that's the actual model. That's the actual linear model. And I can look inside of it. And you can see that there are these um, slightly yellow uh, 
uh, boxes, and those are the input processing um, computations that happen in this model. So creating all of this is taken care of you by the infrastructure, but it's really useful to be able to look at it if you're debugging something or if you just want to know what happens. OK. So what's going on? The linear aggressor I defined is what we call an estimator. We inherited that estimator word from scikit-learn, and it's kind of this very, very similar concept. It supports all the basic operations that you need for an ML model. You can train it. You can evaluate it, usually on separate data. If you take away anything from this talk, is that you should always evaluate your models on separate data when you're while you're training or yeah, during your training. Um, you can query the model for predictions once you've trained it. And then, then this is fancy. You can export what we call a saved model and give it to TensorFlow Serving. There is a talk about TensorFlow Serving tomorrow in the amphitheater at 1.30, and you should all go to it. Um, so these methods all hide a lot of tricky details that you don't have to worry about and that are just done. You can just call them, and you can be reasonably certain that it actually works. We also defined an input function earlier. And that basically reads from data files and feeds data in an appropriate format into the estimator itself. There's a trick here. The estimator actually saves its state to what's called a checkpoint. The checkpoint contains all of the variables that the model contains. And every time we call one of these functions, it'll synchronize with the checkpoint. And this is very important for the distributed setting, where you have several machines, and they all um, do their own thing. But they have to synchronize, and they synchronize when something restarts or when something breaks. They synchronize via a checkpoint. This is also the checkpoint is also what we use to export the saved model. OK, so it's great. So I've shown you how to train a linear model with Pandas input. But what if you want something else, just anything else, really? Well, so all of these components are obviously swappable. So for instance, the pandas input function, you can swap for other input functions. We have several that are just there. It's also pretty easy to write your own. Um, so you can read from NumPy. You can read from any Python generator. Anything you can put out, like anything you can spit out of a generator, you can use. Um, so this makes it very, very flexible. And you can write your own input function, too. It's not that hard. Also, the models that we have are not limited to just linear models. So we have linear regressor classifier. We have a deep neural network, which is a basic straightforward neural network, a uh, basic uh, feedforward neural network. And then we also have estimators that do random, fo uh, random forest, um, k-means, uh, support vector machines, you name it. So all of this is available directly for use. So you don't have to implement it yourself. Let's say we want to swap this out. So first of all, we have to obviously change the name of the class that we're using. And then um, we'll also have to adapt the inputs to something that this new model can use. So in this case, a, a DNN model can't use the, um, these categorical features directly. We have to do something to it. And the two things that you can do to a categorical feature, typically, to make it work with a deep neural network is you either embed it or you transform it to what's called a one-hot, or an indicator. Um, so we do this by simply saying, hey, make me out of the make, make me an embedding, and out of the cylinders, make it an indicator column, because you know, there's not so many values there. Um, usually, this is fairly complicated stuff, and you have to write a lot of code, but this is it. All you have to do is declare, hey, I want an embedding for this, and you're done. Then also, most of these more complicated models have hyperparameters. And in this case, the DNN Basically, we tell it, hey, make me a three-layer neural network with layer sizes 50, 30, and 10. And that's all really you need to do. It's a very high-level interface. Um, for other models that can be you know, more complicated or less, depending. And if none of that's worked for you, there's still also um, you can still take, care, take advantage of the training loops and all of the infrastructure that is in the estimator itself. And you can completely uh, swap out the model and write your own. And the way you do this is we have this estimator base class. And you can put in a, what's called a model function. And this allows you maximum flexibility. The model function uh, takes the inputs, and it produces tensors that contain um, 
the thing that you have to do for training, the thing that you have to do for evaluation. Uh, it returns the predictions, and then it will also produce a safe model if you need one. So you can write all of this yourself if you really want to, um, if none of the pre-existing models fit for your use case. And you can use any kind of, you can use regular TensorFlow to define this model function, or you can use Keras, and, and Francois will say a little bit about that. OK. So the exciting thing about TensorFlow is actually the fact that it runs not only in a single machine, but distributed in a data center. So to make this work, um, we have a utility that uses several workers um, and basically trains the model on all of these workers at once. Uh, we call the distributed, a distributed training run, like a single run of training a model, an experiment. And to make one of those, we first make an estimator, as you've seen before. And then we add the input function and the estimator together and make an experiment. The name experiment comes from hyperparameter tuning. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with hyperparameter tuning. It's a very important concept in machine learning. Basically, you, instead of just training a single model for your data, you train a whole class of models, and you, take, you pick the best one. And it's very powerful. And I'm not going to go into details on this, but the infrastructure for it is all set up. So you can, in the experiment function that makes the experiment, you can pass in hyperparameters. And then you can use those hyperparameters to create your estimator. And then you return that estimator with the experiment. And that way, you can implement hyperparameter tuning. Now finally, this experiment, this function that makes an experiment, we pass to what we call the learn runner, um, which just runs it. And um, it, uh, we, we can pass some user options in, in a run config. And what the run config also does, it, it contains information about the cluster that we run it on. And so we can use that information, for instance, if we make the estimator want to tweak it, depending on how many machines we have available or something like that, we can do that. Uh, so this contains information, how many workers do we have, how many parameter servers do we have, uh, and so on. Um, but the run config also uh, takes information from the environment, and so we don't have to pass it explicitly. So what, what do we have to do in order to declare to TensorFlow, hey, uh, here's a cluster. Please use the whole cluster. Is we write what's called the cluster spec, and this is a very very simple thing. It's just it's simply a map from names of different machine types that we'd want to do different things, and then a list of the all the machines that can do this thing. And usually you have parameter servers or PS, and you have workers, and the parameter servers store the variables. The workers do the actual work. That's kind of traditional. And you just fill out these lists, and you're done. And you save that. You dump that into the second thing here. You dump that into a, an environment variable, and then everything else will work from there. OK. Setting up a cluster is, depends on the environment and, and, environment, and I'm not going to talk in detail about it. But if you are interested, it's on GitHub in the ecosystem repo. There's a number of scripts, a number of examples that help you get started. So one thing I'd like to mention, and I don't know how many of you have seen the TPU talks. This is a, a part of TPUs. Um, if you stick to this, these concepts, your code will basically work on a TPU without modifications. So um, you will be able to use this once you can use it. So what I've shown you is we have, I've shown you we have in TensorFlow implementations of complete machine learning models. You can get started with them extremely quickly. Um, they come with all of the integrations with TensorBoard, for visualization, for serving and production, um, for different hardware, different use cases. They obviously work in distributed settings. Um, we use them in data centers. You can use them on your uh, home computer network if that's what you like. You can use them in flocks of uh, mobile devices. Everything is possible. And they run on all kinds of different hardware. In particular, they will run on TPU, which is nice. They also always run on GPU and CPU, obviously. OK, so before we move on, the full code, again, is at this URL. Um, if you're interested in more, do check out the tutorials on tensorflow.org, and particularly the estimator tutorial. I think that may be the most interesting for people who want to do write their own estimators. And then do go to the talk tomorrow at 1.30 in the amphitheater uh, for TensorFlow serving. 
with Noah. And with that, thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Francois and tell you more. Thank you, thank you Martin. So canned estimators are great for many use cases. But what if you need something that's not available as a canned estimator? What if you need to write your own custom model? That's where the Keras API comes in. The Keras API is this high-level API for building TensorFlow models. And you can use it together with the estimator class and the experiment class that Martin introduced. As you know, TensorFlow features this fairly low-level programming interface where you spend most of your time multiplying matrices and vectors. And that's very powerful. But that's also not ideal for building very advanced, complex models. So we really believe that in the future, deep learning will be part of the toolbox of every developer, not just machine learning experts. Because everyone needs intelligent applications. And to make this future possible, we need to make deep learning really easy to use. We need to make available tools that are accessible to anyone. Because you shouldn't need to be an expert in order to start leveraging deep learning to solve big problems. So if you could design a deep learning interface without any constraints, what would an ideal interface look like? I already think that the core building blocks of deep learning are all fairly well understood. And rather than letting the user re-implement everything themselves, instead, it should be really easy to just take existing building blocks and be able to quickly assemble them to build new deep learning data processing pipelines. It should be basically like playing like Lego blocks. And I think, actually, if you think about Lego bricks, it's the ideal metaphor. Lego bricks are very intuitive to use. They're very easy to use. They provide uh, this very flexible, expressive framework in which you can build almost anything. They allow you to try different things very quickly and immediately get you know, visual, tactile feedback about what works and what doesn't work. And of course, Lego bricks are very accessible. They're accessible to any human being, edges far and above. And that's really the idea, the ideal, I would say, that we had in mind when we designed the Keras API. We want it to be the Lego for deep learning. So let's take a look at what Keras can do. So first of all, I think it's better to think about Keras not as a code base, an API a framework, or um, a library. It's really just a high-level API specification. And it's a spec that has several different implementations. The main one, of course, is the TensorFlow implementation. But there's also an implementation for Teano. There's one for MXNet. Uh, there's one for Java. And there are more coming. And what makes Keras different from every other deep learning interface that's available is its deep focus on user experience. Keras is all about making your life easier, simplifying your workflow, especially in terms of uh, providing easy to use um, building blocks, uh, intuitive affordances, in terms of providing good feedback when things go wrong, and in general, just reducing complexity, reducing cognitive load. And of course, if you make deep learning easier to use, then you're also making it accessible to more people. So the end goal uh, with Keras is to make deep learning accessible to as many people as possible. Until now, the TensorFlow implementation for the Keras API was available as part of an external open source repository. But now what's happening is that we are bringing the Keras API directly into the TensorFlow project. And we are doing that to make Keras work seamlessly with your existing TensorFlow workflow. Concretely, what's happening is Keras becomes available as a new module inside TensorFlow, the tf.keras module. And it contains the entire Keras API. So if you're a TensorFlow user, what that means for you is that now you get access to this new set of easy to use deep learning building blocks that will work seamlessly with your workflow. And if you're an existing Keras user, what this integration means for you is that suddenly you gain access to high level TensorFlow training features, things like distributed training, things like distributed hyperparameter optimization, training on Cloud ML. So that's really powerful. So to give you a concrete sense of what your workflow will be like, 
when using the Keras API to define your models and when using uh, TensorFlow estimators and TensorFlow experiments to train your models in a distributed setting. I will walk you through a simple yet fairly advanced example. We will look at a video question answering problem. So that's what the problem looks like. We have this data set of a few thousand of videos. Each video is about 10 seconds long. It shows some people doing some activities. And um, a deep learning model will be looking at the frames of these videos. And it will try to make sense of it. And then you can ask the model uh, short natural language questions about the contents of the video. So in this example, we have a short video of a man packing some boxes into a car. And you can ask, what is the man doing? And the model will be looking at the video, will be looking at the question, and we'll have to select one answer word out of a set of possible answers. So here in this example, you can ask, what's the man doing? He's packing. And that's actually an interesting question, because if you were to just look at a single frame from this video, you couldn't answer the question. The man could be unpacking as well. So the reason you know he's packing is because of the order of the frames. So we expect our model to be able to leverage not just the visual contents of the frames, but the order of the frames as well. So needless to say, this is a tremendously difficult problem. Just three or four years ago, before Keras, before TensorFlow, this would have been only doable for a handful of really well-funded research labs. This would have been pretty much a six-month project for a team of expert engineers. And what we are doing now is that we are making this really advanced problem accessible to pretty much anyone with basic Python scripting abilities. So we are democratizing deep learning. So that's what our solution looks like. That's our network. It is structured in three parts. So first, you have one branch that takes the video input and turns it into a vector that encodes information about the video. And you have one branch that takes the question and turns it into a vector. So now you can concatenate the question vector and the video vector, and you can add a classifier on top. And the, the job of the classifier will be to select the correct answer out of a pool of candidate answers. So the first step is to turn the video input tensor into a vector. A video is just a sequence of frames. And a frame is an image. So what you do with an image is that you run it through a convnet. That's what you do with an image, natural thing to do, a CNN. And each CNN uh, will extract one vector representation for each frame. So what you get out of that is a sequence of vectors encoding the frames. And when you have a sequence, what you do with it, the natural thing to do is to run it through this sequence processing module called an LSTM. And this LSTM will reduce the sequence to a single vector. And this vector is encoding information about all the frames and their order. So the entire visual contents of the video. The next thing to do is a similar process applied to the question. The question is a sequence of words. And you will use an embedding module to map each word into a vector, a word vector. So you get a sequence of word vectors and reduce it using a different LSTM layer. Once you have your vector representation for your video and your vector representation for your question, you can connect them. And you add this uh, classifier on top, whose job is to select the right answer. So that's really the magic of deep learning. You take these really complex inputs, which could be videos, images, language, sound, and you turn them into vectors. So you turn them into points in some geometric space. You turn meaning into points in a geometric space. That's the essence of deep learning. And what's really powerful about it is that once you've done that, uh, you can use linear, linear algebra to make sense of these geometric spaces. And you can learn interesting mappings between different geometric spaces. So in our case, we are learning a mapping uh, between uh, an initial space of videos and questions and a space of answer words. And we are doing that just through exposure to training data. And the way we are doing this is really by assembling together uh, these specialized blocks for information processing. And it's a very natural thing to do. If you have an image, 
you process it using an image processing module, which is a CNN. If you have a sequence, you process it using a sequence processing module, which is an LSTM. And if you want to select one element out of a pool of possible candidates, then you use a classifier. It's a natural thing to do. So what you're already doing with deep learning is plugging together these information processing bricks that are pretty similar to Lego blocks, right? To Lego bricks. So building deep learning models is conceptually similar to playing with Legos. And if the ideas behind deep learning are so simple, then the, the implementation should be simple as well. So let's take a look at the implementation. This figure is a very straightforward translation of our model into a Keras implementation. On the video encoding side, we have this Inception v3 ConvNet, and we use a time-distributed layer to essentially apply this ConvNet to each frame alongside the time axis of an input video tensor. And then we pipe the output through this LSTM layer, which will reduce it to a single vector. So one interesting thing to note here is that our Inception v3 ConvNet will come loaded with pre-trained weights. And the reason that's important is because with our current uh, video data set, we don't have enough data to learn interesting visual features on our own. So we need to leverage pre-existing visual features that were learned on a larger data set, so ImageNet in this case. And that's a very common pattern in deep learning. And it's a pattern that is made really easy by Keras. And we'll see how in a second. On the question encoding side, it's even simpler. You just run the sequence of words into an embedding layer to produce a sequence of vectors. And then you reduce this sequence of vectors to a single vector using an LSTM layer. So once you have this video vector and this question vector, you concatenate them with a simple concat op. And you add uh, the classifier on top, which is just two dense layers, which will select the correct answer. Let's look at the code. So this is the entirety of the code for the video encoding part. It's just a few lines. It's very readable. It's very simple. You start by specifying uh, your inputs. So this is your video input. It's a sequence of a viable number of frames. So the none here is the number of frames. It's undefined, which means it could change from batch to batch. And each frame is a 150 by 150 image with three ch color channels. In the next step, in just one line, we're defining an entire Inception v3 model, which is a fairly complex model defined uh, in just one line. And it comes loaded with pre-trained weights from the ImageNet dataset. And all of this is built in. It's already into Keras. So you don't have to do anything more. It's literally just one line. And we are not including the top layers, because they are not relevant to us. And we are adding some pooling on top, which allows us to extract exactly one vector from each frame. In the next step, we are setting this covenant to be non-trainable, which means that its representations will not be updated during training. And the reason that's important is because this covenant already comes with good, interesting representations, and you don't want to alter them. Again, so that's a very common uh, pattern in deep learning, to take a pre-trained model and freeze it and make it part of a new pipeline. And it's a pattern that's made really easy in Keras. So once we have this frozen pre-trained covenant, we use a time distributed layer to distribute the covenant across the time axis of the video input. And the result of that will be this tensor of frames, which we run through an LSTM layer to get a single vector for the video. On the question side, things are even simpler. We uh, define a question input as a sequence of integers, uh, a variable number of integers. So why integers? Because every uh, integer will be mapped to a vector in some vocabulary. And we run uh, this sequence of integers into an embedding layer, which will map every integer to one vector. And uh, these embeddings are trained, of course. Uh, it's just part of the weights of your model. And then you run this sequence of vectors through an LSTM to reduce it to a single vector. So one interesting thing to note here with the two LSTM layers that, you, that you've instantiated so far is that 
we were not configuring the layers beyond just specifying the number of output units. And that's interesting because usually when you're using LSTM layers, there are lots of things you have to keep in mind, lots of best practices you should be following to make things work. For instance, you should remember that the recurrent weights should be initialized with an orthogonal initialization. You need to remember that the forget git bias should be initialized to one and many more. And here we are not doing this because all these best practices are already part of the default configuration of Keras layers. It's a very important principle in Keras that best practices come included as default. And what this means for you is that your models will typically just work out of the box without you having to tune every parameter to make it work. So that really ties into our goal with Keras to reduce cognitive load, to reduce complexity. We don't want you to care about these technical details. We just take care of them for you. So once you've done encoding your video and encoding your question, you just use a concat op to turn them into a single vector, and you add these two dense layers on top, which will select one answer word out of a vocabulary of a given size. In the next step, you're using um, your inputs and your outputs to instantiate a Keras model, which is essentially a container for a graph of layers. And then you are specifying the training configuration. So you are specifying the optimizer that you want to use, the Adam optimizer, and you are specifying the loss function for which you are um, optimizing. So that's very simple so far. At this stage, we've defined our model, we've defined our training configuration, and now we want to train this in a distributed setting, maybe on CloudML. So let's see how that works. This is, that, this is where the magic happens. You can use the TensorFlow estimator and experiment classes that Martin introduced to train this model, this Keras model, in a distributed setting in just a few lines of code. All you have to do is to write this experiment function in which you define your model, you use your model to instantiate an estimator using this built-in guest estimator method. And once you have this estimator, you use it to create an experiment. And that's where you specify your input data, for instance. So it's just a few lines of code. It's really like magic. In just a few lines of very readable, straightforward Python code, we've defined a state-of-the-art model, and we are training it in a distributed setting. So to solve this really challenging problem of video question answering, which should have been completely out of reach to almost anyone just a few years ago. So these APIs, these new high-level APIs, are really democratizing deep learning. And that's made possible by two things. On one hand, you have the Keras API, which is this very high-level, easy-to-use, and powerful way to define deep learning models in TensorFlow. And besides being just easy to use, each layer comes with good default configurations, which allows your model to just run out of the box without much tuning. And the other piece of magic is these new high-level TensorFlow training APIs that Martin introduced, estimator and experiment. And together, this allows you to solve any deep learning problem with very little effort. So we think these new APIs are a big step towards democratizing deep learning and making TensorFlow and deep learning available to everyone. And we hope you will find them useful and we are very much looking forward to seeing all the cool applications that we'll be building with SensorFlow and Keras. Thank you very much for listening.